We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 9 or 11 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, well, good morning, ACC. Hey, it's so good to be here with you and good to be back here with you. Last time I was here, I was sharing a little bit about Christian Financial Resources, the ministry that I uh, work with that partners with this church, but I'm glad to have this time to come back and share in the message. Uh, what you may not know about me is that I, uh, prior to coming on with CFR, I was a pastor and a church planter, and so at one point in my life, I had the responsibility of teaching on a weekly basis, and I no longer do that, and um, if I'm honest, uh, there's times that I miss it. So I'm thankful for this opportunity and grateful for the opportunity to uh, share this message with you. Pastor Matt, thank you for uh, the invitation. And um, man, I hope that this morning and uh, the next couple of weeks, as you take some rest, I pray that God will be with you and that it'll be a time of refreshing. This church is such a special uh, place. I've just been able to be here a little bit uh, last time I was here and then again this morning. And I travel all over, and I'm in churches all over the, uh, really all over the country, but particularly in the Northeast. And I get to see kind of behind the scenes of a lot of churches. And when you see behind the scenes of this church, what I've seen is just a faithful uh, team of people uh, that love the Lord and love their church. So um, just excited to be here and have this opportunity to stand on this stage um, and share this message with you. I like to pray before I get started, so let's pray and then we'll just uh, jump right into the message. God, I give you thanks this morning that we have this opportunity to gather in this space, and that we have access um, to your word, that we can uh, open it and that we can read it and that we can gain understanding and clarity into the deep things of God. God, we live in a world where there's so many perplexing things and complex questions that arise and God, I'm thankful that in this series, we're able to explore some of these. God, we know uh, that we won't come to the fullness of answers completely, um, but God, we pray uh, that in that gap, our faith will be a bridge that we'll find ourselves trusting you more and believing in you more, that our lives will be more committed to following you. God, I pray that you guide our time this morning. It's in your Son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So here we are. We're in the middle of this series, at least the second week in this series, asking for a friend. And in this series, we're exploring questions uh, that people have that maybe they're uncomfortable asking. And I think we've all been there, right? Now, now maybe, maybe it's a question that you've had that's, um, that, that for whatever reason, you don't feel like it's an appropriate question to ask, or, or maybe it's a question that you feel like by asking, you will somehow out yourself. And so asking for a friend is this covert way of asking for yourself. The reality is we live in a world, um, we live in a world where it's easy to find answers to our questions. Years ago, if you couldn't find an answer to a question, you had to go to the library, right? Even if it was a simple question that you couldn't find an answer to, you had to go to the library. And I would go to the, this was kind of my pattern of going to the library. I would go to the library, I'd find the section that had the subject that I was looking for, and I would go to a section of books, and I would pull five or six books off the shelf, and I would go to a desk and start flipping through them, and I would have five or six books, and I'm just trying to figure out how to fix my bike. Now <laughs> we're living in a day and age where we literally have a library at our fingertips. The other day I was reflecting on the power of our smartphones, and I said to my wife, no one should ever say, I wonder anymore. Um, because if you really wondered something, like if you really had a question, you would just look it up. You see, we live in this world of instant gratification. We can get answers to almost any question 
But that's not always a good thing. You know, maybe we should allow ourselves to wonder about something sometimes. Maybe we should wait till we could consult a more reliable source. I'm sure doctors will be happy if people stop self-diagnosing. It does nothing but cause anxiety. That pain in your lower abdomen, it could be appendicitis or it could be gas, right? Chipotle may be showing up again. At least that's what Dr. Google is going to tell you. You see, the internet's a great place to find a recipe. It's a good place to get directions. It's a great place to plan a vacation. That's what I'm doing right now. But it's not the best place to discover uh, your, um, your medical diagnosis. And here's another thing I want you to hear. Uh, that it's not a good place or the safest place to explore deep questions of faith. Here's what I know. Your pastors here at ACC are committed to creating a safe space where harder faith questions can be explored. That's why they're doing this series. I love that your church is doing this series. What I don't love, though, is that I've agreed to answer the question, is it ever okay to doubt my faith? Right? I'm just kidding, sort of. Um, But man, talk about a complex question to answer and one that we really can't answer in one morning. I think it's important to acknowledge up front that the way we're wired, our personality influences the questions that we ask. In fact, to some degree, the way we're wired, our personality influences whether or not we even ask hard questions. Now, something you probably don't know about me is that I'm an Enneagram 5. If you're familiar with the Enneagram, the Enneagram is a personality typing system. There's nine personalities, and most people find themselves fitting in one of the nine personalities. Now, the type that most closely aligns with my personality, the Enneagram 5, is sometimes called the investigator. We like to explore ideas, and sometimes just for the sake of exploring ideas. And I can get obsessive about a question and learning all that I can, even about some random subject that in the grand scheme of things doesn't really make a difference. That's just the way that I'm wired. And I've explored all kinds of questions in my life, and nothing seems to be off limits. My brain just can't stop from going there. And if I'm being honest, I've even explored questions of faith. And I've not always gotten satisfying answers. As you can probably imagine, I've struggled with doubt from time to time. Now, I've never walked away from my faith entirely. But there are times that I felt like I was close to it. Now, some of us, some of us in this room won't let our minds go there, right? We'll never ask harder faith questions. But then there's others, other of us that can't stop our minds from going there, and we're constantly asking some of these harder faith questions. Now, I'm not encouraging you to ask questions that you don't have, but here's what I know. My faith has been forged in the crucible of doubt. As I have asked hard questions, and as I've wrestled with the harder faith questions, my faith has grown stronger, and I've become more committed to following Jesus and committed to the belief that the way of Jesus is trustworthy and true, and it's the best way that I can invest and live my life. And I don't think I could have gotten there any other way than by asking hard questions that sometimes led me into the dark shadows of doubt. You know, I was fairly young when I first had my first bout with doubt. Bout with doubt. I, it sounds like I was fighting with doubt, because in some ways I was. Let me give you a little bit of the backstory. When I was about 16 years old, I had a meaningful encounter with God. And um, I don't like to use the word miracle too casually, but at the time it felt miraculous. God was doing something in my life, and I didn't quite understand uh, what it was. Um, he was transforming me in a way that I had never experienced. Now, I wasn't a bad kid, but I wasn't on the pathway to becoming a pastor either. 
but suddenly I felt like God was working in my life and he was transforming me into a different person. Now, I've never experienced anything like this before. It was like I could really sense God's presence with me and I had this sudden clarity around matters of faith and it felt strange at the time. I knew God was doing something in my life. I didn't really know what it was, but I felt compelled to lean in, to trust Jesus, and accept whatever God had planned for me. It was during this season that I committed myself to full-time vocational ministry and to serving the church for the rest of my life. And then unexplainably and kind of unexpectedly, um, suddenly I started to feel distant from God. It felt like God wasn't present with me in the way that he had been and in the way that he had shown up in my life. Now, somewhere along the way, I picked up this belief that's not really a right way of thinking about matters of faith, but I had picked up this belief that it must be some unrepentant sin in my life and that that's why God had grown distant. And that sent my mind racing to discover what it could be. And I was drawn to Psalm 139, and I read it over and over again. I grew close to this psalm, and I want to read it for us this morning, at least parts of it. It starts off in verse 1 with the author reminding himself that he's seen by God. Listen to what it says. You've searched me, Lord. You know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. Now, I don't know about you, but I need it to, to hear that. God sees you. God knows you. God loves you. And then in verse 13, the author of Psalm 139 acknowledges that he's part of God's good creation. Not a mistake, not an accident, but the product of God's good work. He says, you created me in my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know full well. Right? Sometimes we need to just proclaim that over ourselves. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And then the author of Psalms 139 closes with an invitation to God. I love this way, the way he ends this. Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. This Psalm, Psalm 139, it was good for my soul but it didn't make me feel any closer to God. And at that point, I began to drift. I started questioning everything I believed about God. I was seeking deeper in doubt. And doubt for me in this moment was this cognitively ambiguous place between belief and disbelief. I was asking hard questions, and I wasn't really sure what I believed. And to make matters worse, at that point, I was pastoring a church, and I didn't feel like I could be honest with anyone. And so I was silent. I was ashamed. I was isolated. I was questioning everything I had believed. Now, I know we're just getting to know each other, and I hope that wasn't too much too soon. And to be honest, I've never shared this with anyone in public. And at the time, I wasn't processing it with anyone because that's the way shame works. It drives us into a dark hole of isolation. In that season, I learned that when you're struggling with doubt, silence, shame, and isolation are detrimental to your faith, right? When you find yourself in this place where you're struggling with doubt, silence, shame, and isolation are detrimental to your faith. In a place of isolation, I was searching the internet. I was looking for answers to my questions. I found community, but it wasn't the kind of community that nurtured my faith. Now, here's the truth. We're created to live in community with other followers of Jesus where we can support and encourage each other. Faith flourishes best 
in community with other followers of Christ. You must fight that voice in your head that's telling you that you're not worthy or that you don't belong or that you're not good enough or that you're not welcome because that's a lie from the enemy to keep you from the community that's going to support and encourage your faith. Your faith needs the community of Christ, the church, to survive the dark shadows of doubt. And you must be intentional about building community. And you got to do it now, even when you feel like you don't need it, because struggles and hardships, they're not sending calendar invites, right? They're, they're not, there's no push notifications for struggles and hardships and times of difficulty in life. Those have all been silenced, and doubt's not going to announce its arrival in your life or in the life of someone else. You see, you need Christian community to survive the dark shadows of doubt. And it's our duty as followers of Jesus Christ, it's our duty as followers of Jesus to be community for someone else. Now, I'm grateful that the Lord kept me through my seasons of overwhelming doubt. I was on the precipice of disbelief, but God kept reminding me of his faithfulness and his goodness towards me. And even as I walked through the dark shadows of doubt, I discovered that God was with me and his light was even more glorious in the darkness. Now here's what I know, that if you walk with the Lord long enough, you will walk through some seasons where the clouds will descend so low that it's hard to see God walking with you. There may be times that you even feel totally abandoned by God. Your faith will be put to the test, and you'll find yourself asking questions, hard questions, maybe that you've never answered or asked before. In these moments, be careful. Strengthen your commitment to showing up and engaging in community just like this with believers, because struggles and hardships are often portals to doubt. And just as struggles and hardships are rarely chosen, so doubt is often a space we find ourselves in beyond our choosing. Sometimes life has a way of thrusting us into the dark shadows of doubt. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about doubt, and there's some familiar verses that I'm sure we're all familiar with. One is Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Listen to what it says. It says, "'Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding.'" In all your ways, submit to him, and he'll make his pass, he'll make your pass straight. In Matthew chapter 14, there's a chapter, in Matthew chapter 14, there's a popular story where Jesus' disciples are out on a boat. You may be familiar with this story in the middle of a storm, and Jesus comes walking to them on the water. Needless to say, the disciples lose their cool because people don't walk, at least they're not supposed to walk on on water. But look at what happens in Matthew chapter 14. Look at what it says. It says, but Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied. It's always Peter, right? If you ever read through the Bible, it's always Peter that's putting his foot in his mouth saying something that he shouldn't be saying. Peter said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, Jesus said. Then Peter got down out of the boat. He walked on water. He came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. Oh, you of little faith. That's the old version. Oh, you of little faith. I think that's the King James Version. It just comes naturally out of me. Oh, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? You see, the message is clear. God calls us to trust and not doubt. And in this story, even in the midst of the storm, God calls us to trust him. In the book of James, the brother of Jesus writes about this double-minded naturedness of doubt. Look at what it says. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. You see, the message of Scripture is consistent. God 
desires that we trust and not doubt. It's like a thread running throughout all of Scripture. God is calling people to trust Him. God is proving that He can be trusted. God is inviting us into a relationship with Himself that's built on trust. And I want you to hear that today, that God can be trusted with your whole being. You can trust God with everything that makes up your life, your whole being, your whole identity, everything that makes up, makes you, you, you can trust that to God. The best use of your life is to trust it to Jesus and walk in his ways all of your days. But that doesn't mean that you won't struggle with doubt. In fact, in the Bible, there are people who found themselves in this cognitively ambiguous place between belief and disbelief. For instance, in Mark chapter 9, there's a desperate father who pleads with Jesus to heal his son, but he's not 100% sure that Jesus is able to. He's got questions, and Jesus tells his guy, everything is possible to the one who believes. Then look at how this desperate father responds to Jesus in Mark chapter 9, verse 24. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Every time I read this story, I'm thinking, man, you could have stopped at that point of I do believe. But this guy trusted Jesus and believed that he could present his whole self before Jesus. So he says, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Now, what I love about this story is that Jesus is merciful to this father who finds himself in this place between belief and disbelief. And Jesus heals his son. He doesn't judge him or condemn him for his struggles with doubt. And then there's this story of Thomas. Thomas often gets a bad rap. I think the church has labeled him Doubting Thomas. I would hate to make a mistake and doubt and then be labeled Doubting Wesley. Uh, But Doubting Thomas, one of Jesus' disciples, refused to believe that Jesus had risen from the dead, even though the other disciples were telling him that they had actually seen Jesus with their own eyes. Thomas actually says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. But then look at what happens in John chapter 20, verse 26. A week later, the disciples were in the house again. Thomas was with them. The doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Notice Jesus doesn't say to Thomas, after all we've been through and after all you've seen me do, how could you not believe? No, Jesus simply goes, hey, Thomas, here's the evidence you're looking for. Now believe. I think Jude chapter 1 verse 22 summarizes the posture of Jesus towards those who are struggling with doubt. Be merciful, Jude says. Be merciful, to those who doubt. You see, while the scriptures teach that we're created to trust and not doubt, they also make space for those who are struggling to believe. And I believe Jesus wants his church to take the same posture to those who are struggling with doubt. You see, if we follow Jesus and if scripture is our guide, then we'll become a community that makes grace-filled space for those who are struggling with doubt. Now, I get it. There's something within us. There's this impulse within us that's concerned about the faith of those who are struggling. And you should be because dark, doubt is a dark hole. And sometimes we worry that by making space, we may be condoning or encouraging doubt. But the wisdom of Scripture teaches us that in reality, when we're merciful, it does quite the opposite. When we make grace-filled space for those who are struggling with doubt, we make it possible for them to belong to the community that will encourage their faith. You see, it's not about creating space for doubt to flourish, but it's about creating space where the faith of the one who's struggling with doubt can flourish. If you watch Jesus closely in Scripture, you'll notice that over and over again, when Jesus encounters people, he sees their humanity first. He knows that he's dealing with people who are not perfect. Even those who have placed their faith in him and sacrificed everything to follow him, he never forgets that they're humans first, flaws and all. And he doesn't pressure them to conform 
Rather, he creates space where they can be transformed. And so I think it's helpful for us to return to our question that we started with. Is it ever okay to doubt my faith? I think that's the wrong question. You see, framed that way, the question gets at permissibility. Is it permissible? Am I allowed to doubt my faith? And that's not the question we should be asking. Because doubt's not a choice that one just casually makes. It's not a fun place to be in. In fact, the times that I've struggled with doubt, I would have given anything to not be in this cognitively uh, ambiguous place between belief and disbelief, this uncomfortable place. I think a better question for us is, if I find myself in a place of doubt, am I still loved by God? Yes, you are. If I find myself in a place of doubt, am I still valued by God? Yeah, yes, you are. If I find myself in a place of doubt, can I still follow Jesus and be used by God? Yes, you can. If I find myself in a place of doubt, do I still belong to the community of Christ, the church? Yes, you do. You see, what we see in Scripture is that doubt does not disqualify. God does not count you out because you're asking hard questions. God is big enough to handle your questions. Here's what's not okay, though. What's not okay is for you to retreat from God and the church and isolate yourself in a place where your faith is bound to wither. What's not okay is for you to allow doubt to drive you away from Jesus and the community that's there to encourage and nurture your faith. Now, I get it. This is easier said than done. You see, Christian faith is unique because it's fundamentally about a change of identity. When we choose to follow Jesus, we're taking off the old self and putting on a new self. There's a death that happens. The old self dies the new self is raised to life. And that's why baptism is such a powerful image for us. That old self is buried in a watery grave, and that new self is raised to life in Christ. You see, at its core, Christian faith is not about adding religious practices to your life or about becoming a better person or finding friends to do positive things with. The Bible is not a self-help book or a pathway to happiness, fulfillment, or the life you've ever dreamed of. But Christian faith is about a new identity, a new family, a new purpose, a new destiny. And that's why doubt can be so difficult. When the totality of my identity is found in Christ, then a crisis of my faith can shake the foundation of my life. So for many of us, Many of us, even when we find ourselves in the dark shadows of doubt, we find ourselves pressing through. We continue to engage in Christian practices. We pretend like everything is okay. We don't process our questions out loud in community. Even when our faith is crumbling inside, we soldier on. And sometimes it's not because we're afraid of losing our faith. Sometimes we're more afraid of losing ourselves. Now, maybe that's you right now, and you've been going through the motions. Maybe you've stopped believing some of the things you once believed were true about God. Maybe you see the brokenness in our world, and you feel like biblical answers are insufficient. Maybe your present struggles are making it difficult for you to see God as a present help in a time of struggle. Maybe you're watching online because being in a room with people celebrating Jesus feels even more isolating. I want you to know that although it may feel like you're alone, whether you're online or in this room, you're not alone. Many others have been where you are. Many others are where you are are. And we must follow Christ in community with one another, authentic, grace-filled community. It's the only way we can be for each other, the true community of Christ. Now remember this, doubt will drive us into a place of silence, shame, 
in isolation. But these three, silence, shame, isolation, are detrimental to your faith. Faith flourishes in community. You see, the life of faith is a journey. We're all travelers together. None of us have arrived. No one among us has all the answers, but we're better when we journey together. Doubt doesn't have to be a lonely journey. If you find yourself in a place of doubt today, don't let silent shame and isolation determine the direction of your faith. Choose community. Choose to plug in. Choose to engage. Choose a space to gather like this, a place where your faith can flourish, a community where your faith will flourish. Let me close with Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful that, we're thankful that in your wisdom, you declare that you will build your church and that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. God, we're thankful that you've called us to be your church and that we have such confidence that's rooted in you. God, we're thankful that you are God that can be trusted even in the storms of life. And God, I am even more glad that our doubts don't disqualify us and that even when we find ourselves in that cognitively ambiguous place between belief and disbelief, you're a God who shows up in the dark shadows of doubt and you reveal yourself to us. And so God, we ask, please reveal yourself today. Help us to see you in and through one another, this community of faith that's committed to following you together. See your son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings at 9 and 11 a.m. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.